Good afternoon. I guess we'll talk more about cartography this afternoon. Yeah, cartography. So that's uh, supposed to be me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's see if I can get this thing going here. All right. So uh, had it not rained, uh, and a cold rain this morning, I would have walked here today because my family continues to live in the neighborhood to the immediate east of this museum campus. My family first moved to this neighborhood in 1959, just a few years before I was born. During the early 60s, when I was a small child, we lived in this beautiful prairie home in the heart of the butler Tarkin neighborhood. It is my understanding that our family was always made to feel welcome in the neighborhood, and that upon our arrival, the neighbors did not, I repeat, they did not place their homes on the market or flee or be enticed by blockbusting schemes. On the contrary, they came over, introduced themselves, and welcomed us to the community. It remains a neighborhood where to this day, children, small children, walk to and from school, public school. I know what you must be thinking. Damn, he was cute. <laughs> well, in the words of Thornton Dow, life is hard. The welcome to the Butler Tarkin neighborhood was in sharp contrast, however, to the experience of the first uh, African American community to live near the community decades earlier. Upon purchasing its property on Capitol Avenue, a prominent dentist uh, and city councilman, Lucian Merriweather, found his home surrounded by 12, on all foot sides, by 12 foot spite fences, which had been erected by his white neighbors. During the years that followed, and consistent with the rest of the nation, numerous ugly racial incidents occurred in the area uh, due to the pre uh, presence of threatening presence of colored folk moving into the area. Ultimately, the neighborhood residents organized and chose to form an alliance to celebrate diversity rather than allow the social construction of race to divide and conquer their community. Thus, the butler Tarkin Neighborhood Association was founded as the first of its kind in the United States of America. Technically, these museum grounds fall within the boundaries of the butler Tarkin neighborhood. Uh, if you really look at this map, it appears that about uh, 25 people live on the grounds of this museum. <laughs> what we see here are these, these blue dots are uh, African Americans and the red dots are white, white residents. Uh, they represent 25 each. The neighborhood takes great pride in celebrating its diversity. However, and as I use urban sociologist Patricia Whitberg would say, um, and, and these cartography maps uh, edited by a Yale scholar uh, Bill Rankin, these ethnic maps bear a closer resemblance to, 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 to Neapolitan ice cream rather than a, a picture of diversity. But this neighborhood represents a transition from chocolate to vanilla. Um, let's see how Indianapolis compares to other cities. Um, as we can see, it's uh, stratification in this city as we enjoy this 1975 clip by my band, Parliament. <laughs> we got Lou, we got Gary. Somebody told me we got LA. There's a lot of chocolate cities out there. Yeah. <laughs> Gaining on you. Moving in and around you. <laughs> Chocolate City. <laughs> Suburbs. You know, looking at Detroit, it appears that a wall must have been erected. <laughs> like they sprung a leak over here. Wait a minute, a wall was erected, like Berlin, or the wall dividing what is defined as Israel and Palestine, or this one in Belfast, photographed by my colleague Karen Ketty. I understand that America is not a melting pot. It is a quilt, so don't get me wrong, I'm not standing before you today as some 
idealistic integrationalist, we're in the 21st century and our city schools are as segregated now as they were in 1954. Some would say, however, that the flavors are not as savory when you mix them all up. And after over half a century, it doesn't appear that we've made much progress anyway. We just simply keep expanding and generating greater and greater demand for our use of fossil fuels to support sprawling systems that are destroying us. My primary issue lies with the unevenness of it all, which I and many others like me have experienced firsthand as I explore the extent of institutional abandonment in our American inner cities resulting from deindustrialization, historic segregation and discrimination patterns, suburban sprawl, erosion of a viable tax base, racism, inability to accept the concept of desegregation and civil rights legislation, fear, despair, crumbling infrastructure systems, disinvestment in urban school systems, and environmental justice issues which define what I call fourth world conditions. The primary objectives of the fourth world theory are to first of all acknowledge and try to understand the abandonment in inner cities throughout the United States, then investigate the causes which have led to the massive disinvestment and attempt to develop a sense of empathy for the citizens who choose to or are forced to remain in these environments. Sustainability is currently at the forefront of our academic and popular discourse as part of a larger global imperative. However, the value of green is inconsequential when continued sprawling development practices are dictated by historic discrimination and segregation patterns and chronic societal ills. During my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade years, I was forced to move from Butler Tarkin into the Brightwood area where I attended a new chocolate school. The first thing I learned during those three years was that I didn't learn a damn thing. <laughs> Thus, I became acutely aware at a very young age of the structural inequalities and disparity that exist in our society. I was recently approached by the local American Institute of Architects chapter to participate in an exhibit that inspired me to pursue uh, a career in architecture. What about uh, what I've seen inspired me to pursue a career in architecture? What inspired me and continues to inspire me was to try to get a grip on this reality. Thus, I elected to photograph African-American children throughout Indianapolis dressed for school with a backdrop of an abandoned school in their neighborhood in the background. I composed this poem to accommodate and accompany these images. Should I believe that it is my fault simply because of the color of my skin? In 1831, our new and free state of Indiana required that I post bond in order to settle within its boundaries simply because of the color of my skin. Later, Article 8, Section 1 of the state constitution prohibits me from settling in Indiana altogether simply because of the color of my skin. Although emancipated by proclamation, I am denied access to public education in Indiana until 1869 simply because of the color of my skin. Subsequent to the Civil War and the short-lived Reconstruction period, I learned a new word, Jim Crow. I soon understand, however, that neither Jim nor Crow is unique to the South, for I attend segregated schools in Indiana simply because of the color of my skin. Finally, and more than three quarters of a century later, in 1949, the Indiana General Assembly passes a law which declares public policy to provide equal, non-segregated, non-discriminatory educational activities uh, regardless of race, creed, national origin, or color or sex, and to eliminate and prohibit segregated schools from kindergarten to state universities. No longer must I walk by my school in my own neighborhood to attend an institutionally segregated school in another neighborhood simply because of the color of my skin. Although these desegregation laws are passed, my new school quickly becomes resegregated for the other families and their children who originally lived in an architecturally significant school that I could not attend, immediately leave my school and move away from my neighborhood. Thus, I find myself in yet another restricted space simply because of the color of my skin. Three decades later, 
Upon discovering that our schools have been re, or should I say hyper-segregated, it is determined that I attend a new school, primarily populated by the children who earlier fled from my neighborhood, simply because of the color of my skin. In the cold darkness of pre-dawn, I once again walk past my closed neighborhood school, this time to wait for a yellow bluebird bus to ride miles and miles to a place where I am not welcomed by many and at a tremendous expense to all. I contemplate that perhaps it is my fault simply because of the color of my skin. Today, the practice of one-way busing is being phased out. However, over a hundred of my neighborhood schools have been closed and or demolished. Our schools struggle under constant threat as I hear the ghostly voices of children singing and playing echo through the empty chambers and corridors of these once beautiful, once segregated buildings in the midst of this institutionally abandoned wasteland, post-industrial wasteland that I call home, I am inspired by the architecture of what was only in the context of what may become in a new paradigm simply because of the color of my skin. So I want to ask, what difference can design or design learning make in this regard? What can we learn from the butler Tarkenton example despite its Neapolitanness? Is the United States in jeopardy of self-induced, ultimate, and imminent collapse under the weight of its own history? Considering its genocidal, imperial, racist, and sexist legacy, does this nation have the right to continue to preach from the pulpit of American exceptionalism? We will continue. Will we continue to continue to sprawl and to our homogeneous, columbinistic, suburban enclaves while we build new infrastructure and consume fossil fuels at a capacity that requires us to sacrifice our own children in oil wars, mass to protect our freedom. While at home, in our safe spaces, we tailgate weekly to city centers and eat brats before watching our gladiators fight like the Romans did before their fall in new coliseums paid for by taxing the disadvantaged residents of the inner city from which we fled. And for you so-called post-racial progressives, will you join Bank of America and others by quickly and without thorough investigation deny the National Fair Housing Alliance's recent discrimination complaint resulting from uneven maintenance and marketing of foreclosed property in predominantly chocolate and butter pecan neighborhoods right here in this city. Through design learning, the application of fourth world theory can be a springboard for substantive change. It must begin with dialogue that challenges us to consider the ramifications of our actions. Perhaps we can, be, perhaps we can contemplate the words of TED alumnus Majora Carter when she suggests that you shouldn't have to leave your neighborhood to live in a better one. Later. <laughs>